Okay, so for folks who aren't here, um, we'll be covering Reddick Sword, um, Two Three Trees, and Left Leaning uh, Red and Black Trees today. And we'll start with uh, Reddick Sword. So let me again share my screen. Um, okay, could you guys see this? Could you guys see the screen? Yes. Yeah. I knew myself. Okay, great. Yeah. So does anyone want to sort of tell me what like a radix sort is? Like what does this radix mean? Really? Um, or any ideas about radix sort? If if you've heard of any of these sorts. Like so radix sort is like a big category. There are like specific sorting algorithms. And does anyone have heard have any of you heard of any of them? Before, like LSD Reddick sort. Yeah, so uh, there's like LSD uh, Reddick sort, MSD Reddick sort, and counting sort. So these are like the sort of uh, common ones that we'll see in CS61B. Uh, so what Reddick sort really means is just that uh, when sorting, you are look at you are look at each um, digits or alphabet. So imagine you have a string. You either look at it from left to right or right to left, and you have something that's called a radix or a base, which means that for each of this comp these components in what you want to sort, there is a way for you to compare whether uh, one is larger than, smaller than, or equal to each other. So, for example, if, uh, if you're comparing two integers, right, you have, you are maybe you are looking at the, the like the first digits um, from the left, so. And you guys know for numbers, right? From zero to nine, there is a way to compare which one's larger, or which one's smaller. So least significant digit uh, sorting or LSD, radix sort, is simply sorting each digit independently from the rightmost digit towards the, towards the left. And MSD, most significant digit radix sort, is just the opposite. So sorting from left to right. So, uh, so here is the example of LS, LST uh, sort. So arrow shows that which digit is being sorted at each step. So as you can see, um, for LST, you start from the least significant digit. That's why we're all looking at the, at the rightmost digit. And, and then in the next round, uh, we move towards the left. So, um, okay. And for runtime, um, I guess I'll skip this for now because I want to give you guys some practice first on how this actually works. So can we take, uh, let's see, can we take three minutes uh, to work on the first problem? And do you guys need me to also uh, screencast the uh, uh, worksheet or do you guys have it? I'm opening it right now. Okay, yeah, if yeah. you can open it, that would be great. Because usually I can't uh, project both uh, my laptop and my um, tablet at the same time. So, so just sort of uh, give it a shot on this problem using MSC and LSC and see if you can work it out. And then I will mm -hmm. go through it. Wait, what question you said, Frank? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, one point one. So. Oh, one point one. Yeah. One A. Yeah. It's yeah, they say one yeah. A on on the slide, but it's one point one.
Oh, also, um, if you guys sort of have are a bit confused, that is fine. I found Reddix sort like one of the sorting algorithms that the students generally know the least of. Uh, so a lot of my friends, this is a fun story. Uh, they actually last semester when they took it, they actually uh, they only understood like Reddix sort uh, the moment they went into the final exam. So um, if you can't do it, it's not a big deal. Uh, okay, so how is it going? I'm so kind of confused. <laughs> uh, it's okay. What about uh, the other one, the other uh, people? Um. Yeah. Can we go over it? Uh. So, do you want me to go over it, or would you like to go over it? Um. Yeah. I'm kind of confused. Ah, okay, then in that case, um, I'll go over it. I will, uh, okay, so I'm not sure if this PowerPoint will be as vivid as me writing it down, but for time's sake, I'll just go through PowerPoint first, and if that's still not clear, I'll write it on my iPad. So remember how MSC and LSC are just, uh, the difference is just that they start from uh, like either the left or right. So um, can you guys see my, um, like my mouse button, uh, sorry, like the mouse icon on the screen? Yeah. Okay, so I will use that as a pointer. So for MSD uh, sort, you will start from uh, its original unsorted form. Then you're gonna first group, uh, you're gonna first sort them by the most significant digit, right? So what it means is, what it means is that, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna look at a, uh, this uh, string and I'll see that A is actually like the smallest. Uh, possible um, alphabet I can have, right? So I keep it on the top. And then I see uh, this string started with C and this string started with A. So I move this uh, string that starts with A to the top. And then I see uh, T and C. So I move C to the top. And then I see G. G is still larger than uh, T. So I move it uh, to the top. So that moves uh, T downwards to the bottom. Well, and then you guys can see once the relative order of the first or like the most significant alphabet is determined, there is like, notice that there is no changes uh, on the from uh, in the following sorting uh, in terms of like the first most significant digit or alphabet, right? You guys can see it's all like A, A, C, C, G, T, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why is once you finish sorting, like based on the last, the last digit or the last, um, I mean previous by last. Uh, so the previous digit or previous alphabet, the relative order of them is determined. And then within each subgroups, you sort by the uh, the next digit or the next um, alphabet. So as you can, you guys can see, the relative order of these two remain the same from the previous round because they all have C as their next uh, digit or next alphabet, right? But then in, in the group of C, you can see that because C is actually smaller than T, C goes, the, the one with C goes up, right? Can you guys see yeah. that? Yeah. 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 And then uh, moving on uh, forward, there is actually like uh, no changes because I, oh no, sorry. And then the only changes left for us is, the, is within this subgroup where uh, A and G for the last uh, digit or the least significant digit is different. So they move it up and the sorting is done. So I guess the, like the part that is confusing is that once you have the previous um, digit or alphabet sorted, how do you make sure that you can use that for in your next round? And the key is that the relative order uh, of each group is not changed. And you only sort of sort it within the subgroup and, and you know, swap it. So mm -hmm. is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. is, Shafali, is that what is confusing you about for? Um, yeah, so like I didn't uh, realize that we had to keep it in the relative ordering because I don't think you do that for LSD. Oh, uh, for LSD, um, 
the thing with LSD is that, yeah, because, uh, yes, I think you don't have to do that in LSD. And we'll see in, in this example. Yeah, okay, that makes uh, sense. Because you're storing from the least, like, to the most. Um, okay, so let's uh, look at uh, LSD sort then. So notice how uh, there are, so this is like the original sequence, right? Notice how they start, this time they started with the least significant digits. So as you can, guys can see, A, C, G, 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 and T. This is like an increasing order, right? Because in the problem would define that A is smaller than C, smaller than G, and smaller than T. So, and then um, for the second, um, actually, I think for LC, it is that if um, it's mostly gonna depend, depend on like the next um, digit or alphabet that you sort. So as you guys can see, um, in the next round, so the, the round that I'm pointing right here, now um, this, the, um, the second element to the right, sorry, is that the way you say it? Um, or the second I... last element? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The second last alphabet is now in like uh, increasing order, right? And notice that previously we have C, uh, we have this C up here, and but now this term is moved to the bottom. So as you guys can see, uh, the sort of the relative order within each subgroup is actually broken, right? And then in this round, um, it is the third last alphabet that is in um, this increasing order. So uh, generally, um, so so generally, you can you guys can see that. Um, it really, it mostly depends on um, the most significant uh, digit sorting. So like the last round, but why might this sorting from right to left still be useful? Can you guys sort of think of it? Okay, so the idea is that when you, after you've sorted the previous uh, after you have sorted the previous um, digit, right? Sort of digit to the, to the right. Within the same group of the most significant digits, so within like the same uh, group that all starts with the alphabet A, the relative order is already determined. So there is actually still some sort of like um, relative uh, ordering here. Uh, so the idea is that when you come, so uh, when you just, so so when you sort by the um, the last the last round, so like the most significant digit within like the each group, um, the relative order is still kept. So we're really breaking like um, okay. So so this is like something similar to what we see in MSD, right? Um, yeah, but so this is just like the idea of um, radix sorting, um, but. If that is not clear, uh, don't worry too much because 233 and Rev actually is really more important than this. And I think Hug also has a view on Reddit sort. Once you guys see how these sorting are actually implemented in code, I think that will make more sense. So going back to their, um, going back to their runtime. Um, so here are the um, runtime of all of them. Also, do you guys know how counting sort works? No. Okay. Um, I don't know as well. <laughs> ah, so I, okay, it's a very neat idea. So um, let's see. Do you guys want me to talk about it? Because I kind of want to go to like the 233 example. But if you guys want me to cover it, I'll cover it in like three minutes. Yeah. Uh, or I'm, sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's do that. Uh, so what is a uh, what is counting sort? So imagine you have, uh, you want to sort integers, right? So you have some uh, arbitrary sequence, and you want to and here um, basically counting sort is that you first instantiate an array with say um, oh so so the the thing is that you need to know um that you are sorting like an integer or sequence of number, right? So that means that the only possible elements you can encounter within the sequence is like from zero to nine or like a finite 
sequence of number. And then what you do is you instantiate an array with the index corresponding to the possible elements in your sequence. And then what you do, you simply count them. So this is, this is very, very simple. So the first element is three, right? So, okay, in, in the index three, you add, you add one. Um, and, then in, and then you see like zero. So this is also gonna be one. And then you see three again, so this becomes two. And you see uh, four once, and then zero yet again, and seven, eight. Okay, so once you have this, how do you um, finish the sorting? Very simple. So you will start from the leftmost index and you will see that there is a two, right? So um, in an array of same size initiated with all nodes, the f for the first two, you just put in like zero and zero. And you see that there is no one and no two, so you skip. And then you see like there's like two threes. So you have three and three. And then you see like a four and then seven, eight, right? So can anyone tell me why this idea is like relatively, uh, this idea is like very robust and great comparing to uh, say merge sort or quick sort? Like what is its time complexity if you actually think about it? Um, linear? Yeah, it is actually linear. So this algorithm is really a beast in that all you need to do is look at the sequence once, right? And then instantiate it once. So this looking through this sequence is of n type n operations. And then uh, instantiating this array and filling it is also like uh, asymptotically n. So, so yeah, this is in overall a um, linear operation. Um, but if it's if it's so great, why don't we just use it all the time? Um, did you guys have any idea? I'm actually not sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's okay. The, the key is that um, notice the premise of using this sort is that we have to know the sort of uh, the domain, okay, not the domain, but we need to know what is the range of the sort of possible elements we can encounter, right? So here's the thing, if we know um, the only possible elements we can have in this sequence is say from zero to 100, right? Then we can instantiate this counting, uh, this array that we use for counting uh, accordingly. Right, but imagine you want to sort something that you really don't know, like the possible input of it. That will be very difficult uh, if you think about it. Uh, right, so for example, you want to sort uh, your commits uh, in your um, in your GitLib branch, and commit is not really something uh, that you can sort of know, like what are like the possible commits of, because there are so many possibilities. Right, so this algorithm actually breaks down in that scenario. So the limitation of this algorithm is that you will need to sort of um, know like what are the possible inputs. So the possible domain, yeah. Uh, does that clear up the confusion? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, um, okay. So going back to question two, uh, if this is sort of the, like the similar idea, but if MSC and LSC are uh, this fast, why don't we always use it? And this is actually connected to uh, what, I, what I just said. So based on what I just said, um, what do you guys think? What are some limitations to radix sort, like MSC and LSD? Well, can you repeat the question again, Prince? Oh yeah, so if LSC and MSC is also like um, kind of great, then why don't we just always use it? Or <laughs> remember how when I say counting sort, there's like some limitation to this algorithm, right? In such that you can only use it if you know like what are the possible inputs in your sequence. Um, so what about for radix sort like MSC and LSC? 
what are some limitations or like what are like these specific scenarios that we can apply LSE and MSE and what are some that we cannot? That's what I'm saying. Um, I'm not sure if this is correct, but like if we have numbers that are very far apart, then I guess it wouldn't, it'd kind of be pointless. Uh, so what do you mean by numbers that are very far apart? Like, or like if we have a really, like a data set with mostly small numbers and then we have a one really large number, it'd be going through multiple iterations um, without doing for just that right. one, yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. So what Shafali is saying is, um, can you guys see the chat section? Um, chat. So I want to give some example, but I can't. Okay, wait. I think there's a. I can actually. <laughs> can I write here? I don't think. Okay, I don't oh. think the chats got recorded. Um, for those who are not attending the section right now. Oh, uh, I think the recording got. Is it? Did it got interrupted? It's, it's, it's still, still recording. recording. Oh, I think it is recording. It's recording to the cloud. So. Oh, but you mean the um the part on. No, this meeting is recorded. So I think my, um, the things on my iPad also got recorded. Yeah. Yeah, so what Shefali is saying is, so imagine you have a number that has like 1 million digits, right? And then you have some other number that's like one or two digits. Then after sorting those like one or two digits once, you will, you basically don't, don't have to sort anymore, right? Because you know the remaining one with 1 million digit has to be larger, but then you are still looking through like each of the digits of that number such that you have to look at it a million times without doing any sorting. And that's really a waste of work. So yeah, indeed, that is one of the drawbacks. Another thing is that um, radix sort is only possible when elements uh, can be actually compared with some sort of radix or base. So this goes again back to my example. So for strings and alphabets, you know like um, how to order them, right? But imagine you have to, uh, imagine Hilfinger throws like a bunch of Enigma rotors at you and tell you to sort it. Like, how would you uh, do MSC and LSC on that, right? So, um, and why do I use the example of Enigma? Um, Professor Hoofinger likes to incorporate like project ideas into like conceptual questions. So I'm not sure if I talked about this, but last semester for the final, he has a question on hashing, but like ask us to hash like a Enigma machine. You might have heard of this before. So yeah, when you're confused, you can think of some examples in the project and you'll realize that it is, these sort of algorithm is not always applicable um, towards specific input. Okay, great. So, well, now let's go to two, three trees. Um, I think we're still at one time. Um, okay, but I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Um, any questions on Reddick sort? No. Great. So, uh, let's look at some terminologies for uh, two, three trees. So two, three tree is um, what we call like a self-balancing structure or a balanced search tree in that um, you guys might recall previously with binary search tree, one of the problems is that say you input all the elements sequentially, right? So for, for a binary search tree, you input, uh, you, you sort of insert one and then two and three and four. Uh, what's going to happen is that it's going to, uh, because each element that you input is always larger than a previous element, it's going to happen that it's always going to be the left, uh, or it's always going to be a right child of like the previous element, so that you will end up with a spindly uh, binary search tree that's leaning like towards the right. And that will have a very bad um, runtime because for a bushy binary search tree, you usually have a log in runtime. But then in the case of like a spindly tree, you have like a linear runtime. So, and that breaks the point of having binary search tree. So, Trees like two, three trees are um, structured that can balance itself so that it's always bushy. So when I talk about a node, um, in a two, three tree, unlike a binary search tree, a two, three tree can have nodes that contains more than one element, right? So uh, in this case, you can see that this element, uh, this node has like two elements. And the element is just like uh, the number that's like within each node. And the children is the same idea that it's like uh, the children of like the parent um, node. So here's a trick about how you, how you can sort of know like how many um, possible elements are contained in a node and how many possible uh, children we can have. 
So the first number two here, that indicates like how many elements you can have in one node. And the second number here, three, that's like how many uh, children you can have for a parent node. So, so for a two, four tree, right? So say we encounter a variant of two, three tree, so say a two, four tree, then the number of elements within each node will be, will remain the same, but the, but the difference is that it can have, it can have like four uh, children as opposed to three. So uh, first, first number, um, number of elements in a node, second element, number of a child to a parent. Yeah, so this is exactly uh, what I just said. And notice that it still sort of follows uh, BSD properties, right? Because all the elements in the in the left child uh, in the left child is no larger than the parent node. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna walk you guys through uh, inserting this. Um, so do you? I, I think a better idea is still that I can draw it. So I'll draw it out. Uh, but I just want to do a quick poll. How many of you have already learned about two, three trees in discussions? I haven't. Uh, we well, went oh. over it, but um, yeah, I guess I need a review. That's what about Kathleen? I watched um, Hug's lecture on it. Oh, okay. I think uh, Hug's lecture is like really great on, on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you want to catch up with lecture uh once again the best idea is always two times speed watch professor hugs lecture and then okay at least from my uh, experience the best idea is you watch it in two times speed and then you skim through the slides of professor Hilfinger, so so that you know you won't miss any other concept so have you guys heard of skip list like what is a skip list um so oh. I think yeah, I have. it is one of the concepts covered by Professor uh, Hilfinger, but not Professor Huck. So I would still recommend you to go through it. Okay, so we want to insert eight, uh, 18 into this uh, BSC. So if I were to insert 18, which sort of node would it go to based on your understanding of not just two, not two, three, three, but like say just binary search tree? Which part of this tree should I put it on? Uh, you can just shut out like the the elements in that node. Um, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you want to uh, because you will start from the root. You'll realize that the thing you want to insert is larger than eight. So you'll go to the left and go to the left again, and then because it's still larger than fourteen, and you'll reach here and you'll put it in this node. Okay, but what are some problems with this operation? Or what are some, is any property or constraint being violated? So, so remember, we, this is a two, three, three. Uh, okay, so. Is it more than like two? No. It's... Yeah, it is more than two elements in a node now. Because now you inserted 18, right? You will have three elements in the node. So, in this case, the property of 233 is violated. So what do we do to sort of remedy this? Um, so for 233, when you have a node that has more elements than, uh, uh, than specified, you, what you always do is you push the middle element up to its parent. And what do you do next? Uh, okay, let me see if I can cover this up. Um, and what do you do next? So notice that once you, uh, okay, let me just redraw it. Um, it's hard to draw on the printing, on the printed tree. But once you have it up, right? Now what you are left with is 10, 15, and 18. So remember how previously 16 is like within this node with the other two elements? Now you need to split this node such that 15 is in between is like the middle child of the 14, 16 node. So why do we need to make this split such that 15 and 18 is no longer together? This is because of, of you want to follow through binary search tree pro properties, right? So uh, 15 is large, as the right child of 14 is still larger 
but as the left child of 16, it's smaller. So by splitting it this way, we can cleverly uh, sort of resolve the, the valley, the country. Any questions on that? Great, so what about, what, what if now we want to insert 12 into, these, uh, into this BSC? What do we do? Um, it goes with the 10. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you put it here. Uh, this is the same as like inserting it in a BSC. Uh, the only difference is that you actually put it in a, in a node, right? So, okay. And now I also want to insert 13. Uh, insert 13. So you again have three elements, right? So this time you are still doing the same. You are pushing the middle element up. But, okay, now there's another problem because now you have three elements again in this node. So if that happens, you apply what we are gonna do recursively. So for this, if, if the result of pushing a middle element up to its parent node will result in the parent node having more than two elements, you again push the middle element up for the parent node. So you again push the middle element up here. And now your root node has uh, two elements. And what do we do here? Um, we also need to split. Um, so because uh, you can sort of see that um, whenever we push a node up, we want to split its uh, children into like nodes that contains only one element, right? So this will again please be split into like, oh shoot, um, 12, 16. And what about its uh, child? So the elements that's smaller than 12 will follow binary search tree property. Um, and 15, because it's smaller than 16, it's gonna go on the left. So I would, I would say a, um, when you implement this, this is definitely more work because you have to put each element uh, correspondingly. But the good thing is that most of the time you only have to draw it. And when you draw it, all you need to think about is how well a normal BFC works. So when you split, you are, you are just f sort of following like nor normal binary search tree properties. And this is how you can get a, the final um, two, three tree. Uh, and notice that no constraint is validated here. We can at most have three children for a parent, and we can most have two um, elements in a note. Okay, any questions on that? Great, so now let's talk about how two, three, three, and left leaning red and black tree uh, corresponds. So notice that this idea is neat, but um, when you actually write it in code, it's it's sort of difficult because, um, because you have like multiple children, right? So when you're trying to do sorting and like, as I said, like, Re, um, reorganizing this when you push nodes up, it's actually complicated. So the idea of the left leaning red and black tree is that you want to represent a two, three tree with a binary search tree uh, structure, such that when you actually code it and implement it, it's less complicated. So what I mean by that, so um, let's see how I can explain this. So I'll first convert like the this resulting two and three tree into a red and black tree, and then I'll explain uh, why it makes sense. So has any of you uh, sort of learned about red black tree in discussion? Or Kathleen, have you watched a lecture of red black tree already? Yeah, I watched the lecture. Uh, for Professor Huff, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is, um, okay, what about Shafali and Vina? Have you guys ever heard of Red black tree or her. I heard of it, but like I feel like um I don't understand like thoroughly the red black tree. Okay, what about Chappelle? Um we did it in discussion, so I know a little bit about it. Right. Uh so since we have um like since we have uh sort of I guess uh you guys are learning it from like different channels, I wouldn't go into like the the, the, like the real details of it, but I would rather just illustrate the idea. Um, but for concepts like rotation, um, I think it would be great if you guys can watch Professor Hugg's lecture. He has a really good explanation on this. But I'll talk about how you want to convert it first. So um, for this one, um, 
notice that the only thing that the first thing we need to resolve is that in a binary search tree, you can only have one element in each node, right? So how do we sort of represent a two element node with like within like a binary search tree? And a very neat idea is that what you can do is you can create like a um like a dummy node that represents like both of the elements um uh in a bar in in the in the in the two element node right so what what i'm saying is that you set a dummy node and whenever you see the dummy node you know that in reality so in the corresponding two three tree you have these two elements that's like the child uh that's like the children of it is actually like one note, right? But the potential problem with this is that you're actually just wasting spaces because you need to set up a dummy node and it actually contains like no information. And it makes, but in, and like in actual binary search tree, you don't have like a node with no information, right? So how do we resolve that? Here's an even more clever idea. Uh, and what I'm saying might sound familiar to you, uh, Kathleen, because I borrow, I borrow like the reasoning from Professor Hub. Mm -hmm. But instead of having a dummy node, what we can do is that we can just mark that some node in this BSC is actually affiliated to, to the other node. So what I'm saying is that if I color this element A as red, and I always remember that the left child that is red to a black node is actually the same uh, in the same node in a two, three sheet, then Whenever I try to convert a red black tree back to a binary search, uh, a two three tree, right? All I need to do is just place them together again into a node. So I would I would just color it differently um, in the actual BSC, and as you can see, all of the um, rest will be the same. So notice that because in the original two three tree, twelve is actually like to the right of eight. So when we, whenever we drop the eight down and color it red, we actually want it to bring all its children. So 12, 10, 13. And this is also the same because we have no elements with two, um, uh, we have no nodes with two elements, right? So red, the rest is the same as just drawing an ordinary BSC. So notice that the only thing we did is that for each of the node with two elements, we drop the left node down and color it red so that we remember when we actually want to convert it back, it is actually within the, the two elements are in the same node. So because we're always dropping the left node down with a um, with it coloring red, so the resulting tree will always be leaning towards the left, right? So that is why we call it a left-leaning uh, red black tree. Okay, so any questions on, on that? Or um, is there anything that you guys learned from maybe discussion or watching the lecture that you want me to clarify on? Uh, okay, if not, uh, I think that will be it for today's discussion. But I will stay in the room for 20 more minutes because there's this extra practice on actually implementing the red black trees uh, in, with code. So if you are interested or if you have time, you can stay, but if you need to leave, uh, feel free to do so. I will, because I will like post the entire thing on, um, on like YouTube. So you won't miss it. Don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Thank you, Prince. I gotta go right now because I still have another meeting. Yeah. Uh, me sure. too. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Uh, Thank hopefully you so much, today's uh, lecture helps on two, three. And yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, let's continue on uh, question six. So question six, um, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna read the question out loud because it's kind of funny. 
those darn Stanford students are at it again. In an attempt to reverse engineer your code, um, they steal your get and put methods. Fortunately, you understand Red Black Tree pretty well. Consider your now incomplete RB tree implementation. Okay, so basically all this prompt is saying is that part of your code got uh, got stolen and you need to re-implement it for a Red Black Tree. And so we're given um, we're given skeleton code for a Red Black Tree. And all we need to implement is the get and put method. So notice that get and put corresponds to sort uh, to searching an element in Red Black Tree. That is like get. And for put, it's just inserting an element. So this question actually tests your conceptual understanding of how insertion and uh, sorting or retrieval works in uh, red and black tree. Okay, so let's take a look at the code first. So notice that there are two, um, there are two uh, static fields here, such that and there are off boolean values. So for all the red, it's it's called as true. Uh, it's assigned to true, and for uh, black, it's assigned to false. So what this simply means is that in this red and black tree, if we were to color a node with different color, we're gonna color it with red and black. But in the actual representation, we're gonna say it's either uh, true or false. And if it's false, we'll know it's a black node. And if it's true, we'll know it's a red node. So yeah, so basically you're just checking if it's red or not. And let's look at this internal um, node class. So for each node, it has a key. So a key is what you use uh, for comparison. So, so for any BST, when you are sorting uh, either to the left or to the right, you're simply, compare the, you're simply comparing the key of the parent to the key of the children. And for the values are the actual data you want to retrieve. So you don't have to worry about it when you're uh, just going down your tree. But eventually, when you reach the node that you want, you want to return this value. And left and right are just the same as um, BSC in that left is like the left child and right is like the right child. And color, which is a Boolean, is just an indi indicator of red, whether the node is red or not as we've seen uh, before. And size is just like, uh, I think it means how many nodes you have in a subtree, but uh, I don't think it's that uh, relevant in this question. Okay, so let's see. So whenever you approach a problem uh, like this in 61B exam, what you always wanna do is that, usually they will give you some um, naming that is not very specific, like what's the runner and what's the CMP. And uh, a very good way to start is you sort of want to sort of uh, guess or deduce what these uh, variables actually mean and what they want to use this variable for. So from the name runner, I can sort of see that maybe this is just gonna be our pointer. So that be, so for example, when we go down in a red black sheet, this is like your current position, right? You're running down uh, a red and black sheet. So this is just like the current position. You can make a note here. Okay, so, and then there's a while condition here. Um, so how you wanna deal with this uh, while condition? Uh, notice that while only stops when the um, condition within this parentheses is no longer satisfied, right? So when you are trying to get an element uh, from a red and black tree, usually you want to stop going down when you actually reach the node that you want. Or maybe another case will be when you have reached a leave node, right? So you can no longer go down. So let's leave it now and see which of the case that is. So within this while node, but you'll know that this while loop, the entire while loop, is just you go, what it's doing is just you going down the RB tree, right? So, okay. Um, 
So let's start with, so since we're not feeling this blank yet, let's start with uh, the variable here. So CMP, uh, it could can. CMP in 61B um, usually means like compare or like it's like an acronym of compare. So for this, so this is probably some value to, that you want to uh, compare uh, with some other value. And notice that in the input, we're given a key, right? So the key is the element that is the sort of index of the element that you want to retrieve. So uh, it's pretty likely that you're trying to compare this key with some other thing. So what is this other thing? So notice that you have a pointer of your current position, right? So you're probably trying to compare this key to like the key of this, of your current, of where you're at in the, like the node that you're at in the, uh, as your current position. So usually when we start with, uh, you know, sorting any sort of tree, we always start from the root, right? So I'll just set my runner as my root. And when you're comparing, notice that all you can do is you wanna compare what you're looking for with the roots key. And if they're the same, that means you've actually found it. If they're different, you, you haven't found it. So let's do this key dot compare to. This is uh, the compare to method in the comparable um, class. Okay, comparable, is it a class or an interface? Either case, um, I don't need to check that, but because I forgot, but the idea is, this, is, is the same. So you want to compare it to root.key. Okay, and these if else, right? So following this logic, it probably means like whether you found it or not, or uh, whether you, if you haven't found it, if you want to go to a left subtree or the right subtree. Um, so notice that for the compare to method, uh, conventionally, also I think this is specified in the comparable class. Uh, let me use red to mark this. If the compare, if your key, usually if your key is less than what you're comparing to, um, then it is gonna return negative one. And if it's larger, it's usually gonna return one. And if it's equal, it's just gonna return zero. So this is just like, a convention, I believe, in Java, in Java's uh, compared for Java's compared to method. So return zero. Okay, so based on this, we can now fill in each of the corresponding condition. So if the key is less than the roots key, right, in the in a tree, you'll want to traverse into its left subtree. So if CMP is less than zero or e equals equals negative one, uh, doesn't matter, but just to be safe, um, CMP less than, if CMP is less than zero, then your runner is gonna be your current runner, which is in the first, in the first level, it's gonna be your root, but your current position dot left. So your left child. Else if CMP is larger than zero, you wanna traverse to the right subtree. And otherwise, that is the case when CMP is equal to zero. That means you found your um, node, right? So which you, you can actually return um, the value of the runner because your runner is where, uh, is actually exactly the node that you're looking for. So dot val, because you want the associated data. You don't want to do dot key because the key is just something you use to sort for, but you actually want the associated data. So you want to put dot val. Um, okay, so now notice that when we reach the node that we want, we'll automatically determine it, right? So for a while condition, we no longer need to implement the same condition. Rather, uh, so remember what I said previously that there are two cases. You want to terminate, terminate when you've either found the node that you're looking for or when you've reached a leaf node. Since the second case, since the former is already taken care of, we just want to implement the second case that I talk about here in the while condition so that it can actually stop. So it's just going to be runner not equal to null because 
when you run it as well, you've noticed that your previous layer is actually a tree and you just want to return that the element is not found. Okay, great. So uh, now we want to implement the put condition. So insertion in, um, insertion in red and black tree. So what you want to start is that, um, is starting by looking at what are the arguments in the signature. So you have a node. This is the node that you want to put. Um, and you have its corresponding key and value, right? So um, let's see how I can. So the base case will be if the node that you're inputting is actually, um, OK. Yeah, actually, let's skip the base case first and uh, let's look at, so you can always like, at least for me in, in when you're trying to re implement a recursive structure, you can always take, a, take care of the base case later when you have resolved like the recursive cases. So again, the CMP means, means compare and this time it is prob probably the same logic that we wanna compare the key of the node that you wanna insert to, to the key of your current position, right? So what you want to do is um, you want to compare to, okay, so what is the, what is keeping track of our uh, current position, right? So at this point, you will realize that uh, unlike the previous example where we, where we keep track of a runner, there's actually no sort of runner that we can keep track of. So, so now going back to this, we'll probably notice that this node H here is actually does not mean like the node we're inserting uh, in, but rather the node that indicates our current position. So this is sort of an example of how you can skip something and you can go towards uh, the following code and sort of deduce what uh, an argument might be used to. So let's assume that this H is just the same as the runner. Um, so we'll do, H dot key. So this is just like the same as runner dot key. And if it returns a negative one, so um, we're just gonna set the sub the left sub tree uh, as the output of our recursive column put dot H dot left. Why? Because notice that the output of our function put is actually a node. And this node is not just representing the node itself, but the entire subtree, right? So assuming, taking the recursive leap of faith that, assuming that we know that this is gonna succeed, uh, we can simply set the left subtree as the result or the output of put, uh, a put of h dot left key and value. And then uh, if CMP is larger than zero, it is the same logic where you set the right subtree as the result of we calling this rec function recursively on the right, on the right um, subtree. Well, other, otherwise you will know that you have reached the sort of node that you wanna put this element at. So all you need to do is just assign the current nodes element to the, a, the value of the kernel to the value that you want to put in. So, yeah. Okay, so um, now for, so what are these other conditions? Notice that these are the conditions where you actually need to do rotation, right? So this is sort of just rebalancing uh, red and black sheet. And if you don't know when uh, you need to uh, rotate the tree, uh, Professor Hugg's lecture will really help. Uh, I would, I'm just gonna implement this. So basically, uh, when you wanna return left, when you wanna rotate left for, at your current node is when you have realized that your right child is red, 
and your left child is not red. Uh, these are all just like um, the conditions when you rotate in red and black. So don't worry too much about it. And when you don't want to rotate right, it's, it's when you realize that your left um, child is red and the left child of your left child is also red. So that would look like something like this. And then you want to rotate right. Okay, great. And what is the last condition? So the last condition, um, remember in red black sheet, um, sometimes when uh, when both of your left child and your right child uh, are all red, what you need to actually do is to flip color. Um, so let's see if we have a flip color operation here. Ah, here you go. So they've actually already implemented it for us. So we can just use it for granted. So uh, this is basically process of elimination. Once you've implemented, once, if they give you both rotate left and rotate right, then the only case you want to take care of and handle is just a flip color um, situation. So let's just implement that. So when both of your left child and right child uh, are, are red, you want to flip the color. Oh, sorry. You want to flip the color of, because it, the method returns void of your current, of your current node. Um, so what is going to be the size of your, uh, of your current node? So, the size of a node is just this node plus the left subtree and the number of nodes in the left subtree and right subtree. So we can do this rec recursively. Um, it's just gonna be size of h dot left plus size of h dot right plus one. Okay, so now we this is so I guess we're done and now we're completed with the red and black tree um, implementation. So I recommend you to actually uh, just take another look at this code. Um, and if possible, um, try to do like either the corresponding lab assignment or homework assignment so that you really understand how you can actually implement. Um, I think sometimes uh, interviewers will also ask you questions about red and black trees. Okay, folks. Uh, thanks for watching this and uh, I'll see you guys next time.